the other 30 years war, World War I and II, 1914 to 1945. Of course, the first 30 years war was the European War, 1618, 1648, uh, the ending of which um, stopped the religious wars in Europe, in other words, between Catholics and amongst the many Protestants, led to 8 million people dying, the worst war up to that point in the world, uh, but also ushered in sort of the modern political world. You know, again, political scientists usually say that the 1648-ish is really kind of the beginning of modern day nation states. Flash forward, 300 years and you get an even bigger war. This becomes uh, the large war. Now, we tend to talk about these two wars as you know separate entities, World War I, and then 20 years later, the sequel, World War II. And to be honest, most of the time, I'm gonna kind of do the same thing. But, you know, it's sort of like when you look at, you know, 100 years later, looking back, at this, it's sort of like if you were to look at your computer screen really closely, all you would see is pixels. Or you, you maybe, you know, if you look at a photograph really close, you might just see one face. But as you begin to back out of that photograph or back off of your computer screen, you know, those pixels start to form a pattern. And that pattern becomes sharper and sharper the further away you get. And same with a photograph, you know, you might just see one face, but as you back up from it, suddenly it's a bunch of faces and you realize, oh, I'm looking at a, a photograph of a class instead of just one, it's not a portrait of a person, it's a portrait of an entire class, you know? And so again, a lot of the patterns of history, we don't notice for a hundred years, 300 years, 500 years later. And we are beginning to change how we talk about these two wars. And already some historians are beginning to say that these are, instead of being two distinct wars, they're really just one. And, I, and I'm shifting that way. Um, again, a couple of years ago, I, I, I changed this lecture. Uh, I used to do it as two separate lectures. Now it's really just one big lecture. And even though I'm still gonna really talk more about World War II and talk about World War I as almost sort of the prequel to it, at the same time, I'm purposely putting all of this together because again, I think history is changing to really view this as one large conflict. Because if you look at the world between 1914 and 1945, even though there's obviously these two major events uh, that we call World War I and World War II, but in between, there's almost constant fighting somewhere in the world. And again, it, it is almost impossible to really kind of say this is when the first war ended and this is when the second war began. Uh, I think in the U.S. it's easy to do that. In U.S. 1, I don't do this uh, because in U.S. 1, I mean, excuse me, in, in U.S. history, at uh, the end of World War I, we, we literally walked away from the world. We were done and we don't come back to dealing with the world until Pearl Harbor 1941, but everybody else is dealing with constant conflict. So. Now this is uh, part one of a three-part lecture. Part one will deal specifically with what we still call World War I and the immediate aftermath. And then the second part will deal with the rise of two types of political systems, uh, fascism and communism. But we'll also talk about that 20-year period between these wars. And again, you, you'll see it's actually quite hard to say this is when World War I ended and World War II begin. Uh, and then part three will deal with what we still call World War II and the immediate aftermath of that. The reason I start this, of course, um, with a cemetery is because uh, there, there really is nothing like these two events. Now, just talking about World War I, the Great War, 1914 to 1918, not even getting into all the other stuff, um, it, the numbers really are shocking. The first 30 years war of the 1600s, again, 8 million people die in that, and that was over a 30 year period. Here, we're talking a little over four years. And yet, um, in battle, we're talking over 9 million soldiers would die. And that doesn't even include all the civilians that died. England will lose about a million in this war. Uh, Russia, about 
million, French 1.3 million, and the Germans just under 2 million. And that's not even everybody that fought in this war. It, 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 we really do forget, I think, especially Americans. This is this is one of our forgotten wars. We, we totally forget about this. And partly because we were only in it really for, you know, as far as fighting less than a year, we were barely in this war. Um, but for everybody else, uh, like if you go to Europe, whether it's Scotland where I take students or England or Germany or France, every town you go to, and I can just tell you, even just talking about Britain, every town you go to, uh, often the biggest monument or memorial in town is World War One. Every every town got touched by this war. Um, now there weren't any fighting in Britain, but once you get into Germany and France, uh, you know, the, you know, then then you're starting to get into battlefields, and you really do realize that this completely transformed Europe. Um, and then you know something that everyone's talking about right now here in April 2020 with the pandemic, and that of course is the 1918 Spanish flu that killed over 50 million people. You you add that, and that happened you know just after World War One, and then you really realize, oh my gosh, you know th this period just completely transformed the world. So. Again, we're going to talk about sort of the road to war uh, and the first and the war I'm talking about here is, of course, building up to the Second World War, which will be, you know, about 10 times worse than the first war. Those numbers I just read you, they're going to be even worse for World War II. Um, but World War I is, without a doubt, the first chapter in any history that you're going to look at for World War II. So we're going to look at, to, again, today. How did World War One begin, um, and then how did it end, and how did that affect things? So World War One and the Treaty of Versailles. And uh, when we talk about the Treaty of Versailles, what we're really talking about is really a series of treaties that ended this war, and they were held at the Palace of Versailles, which uh, obviously is just outside of Paris. And this all came about during the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, again, that happened at the end of World War One. So we tend to think of this war primarily as a European war, and that's not completely wrong. Obviously, this is a war uh, about empires fighting each other. And of course, at this point, those empires were primarily European empires, the French Empire, uh, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the British Empire, which was the largest, the Russian Empire, um, but to a smaller degree, also the Ottoman Empire. Uh, basically, today it would be pretty much Turkey, uh, but really think of it as the Muslim Empire. And that goes back to the very beginning of this class. I mean, that was one of the first groups we talked about was the, the Islamic world. This is what's left of the that Islamic world, if you will. And there's and it's not wrong to think of it as a European war. Um, and it was a series of conflicts between these large empires uh, that controlled most of uh Africa and control the huge part of Asia, which also includes the Middle East. But to really understand this war, which is a confusing war, uh, you know, every time I teach this, I always look at my notes. In fact, you might hear me rustle my notes a little bit, because uh, unlike other wars, it's not clean and simple to explain this war. And I'm not even going to pretend that what I'm going to do today is any way authoritative. This is just trying to get you a, a simple understanding of it. But I think one way to look at this is, again, sort of like, you know, looking at your screen up close and only seeing the pixels, you really need to back up. And you do need to think of this from a worldwide viewpoint, because, again, these European empires, I mean, those actual empires were, you know, in Africa and in Asia. And to a large degree, what this war is really about is oil. This is about power through oil. Um, Britain was, again, the largest empire. Most of his empire lay in places like Egypt and India and other parts, what is today Iraq and the Middle East. And Britain was just switching from coal power to oil as its main source of power. It had, you know, again, a, a lot of a, a, a ports on, in the Middle East. It had, it had, you know, the Suez Canal. It had, 
you know, it, it had it had a a a, a, ton, a a pipeline, if you a literal and figurative pipeline of oil coming from the Middle East to England and the rest of his empire. But in 1911, the German Empire, which you know we forget how major of a country Germany was. I mean, Germany was it may not have had the largest empire, but it was pretty much number one in almost every category: science. Uh, medicine, uh, education, technology, weaponry. I mean, it was the modern nation. And they had just built in 1911 a railroad connecting um, Germany with the Middle East. And they were making deals with other countries. They were very aggressively going after the UK. And UK felt very threatened by Germany. So the events I'm about to talk about, that's really it. I mean, understand that Germany uh, is, is really being incredibly aggressive here. And Europe, excuse me, England is incredibly fearful of Germany. And it, the events I'm about to get into, uh, if these events didn't happen, Within a couple of years, something else would have happened. It was almost, and I know historians, we don't like to say inevitable, but it was almost inevitable that these two were going to go to war within the next decade. It may not, you know, it happened this way, but it had, had it not happened the way we're about to talk about, it would have happened some other way. So really, you know, kind of look at this as a much larger viewpoint to sort of understand this. So as many of you already know, it's one of those trivia questions. It's one of those things, you know, when, when you take those standardized tests in high school, it's one of those facts you have to know. What is the cause of World War I? And it's the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And of course, my, my reaction to that is always, who the hell is Franz Ferdinand? There's a great band in Scotland called Franz Ferdinand that I like a lot. But other than that, who cares about this guy with the goofy mustache? Um, and I'm going to come back to that mustache in just a moment. Um, he, was, he wasn't even the leader of Austria. And Austria is, you know, was in charge of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, it was his uncle, Franz Joseph, who was the emperor of that empire at this point. He was 84. He wasn't going to be around much longer. He wasn't very functional. I mean, Franz Ferdinand was, for all intents and purposes, really the emperor, but he wasn't technically yet. So who cares that he got shot and killed? Why does that matter? And in a way, that itself doesn't matter. But it is, you know, you strike a match, who cares? It's just a match. But if you strike that match and you throw it on a pile of dynamite, and then the dynamite explodes, and then that pulls the whole building down, suddenly that match is pretty important. And Franz Ferdinand, if you will, is the match. In fact, actually, it's somebody even more insignificant than Franz Ferdinand, who was, I guess you could say, the actual match, <laughs> to get too into this analogy. Uh, but it is important. But, but had this guy been killed five years earlier, who cares? It's just when and where he was killed that matters. By the way, getting back to that weird mustache. The late 1800s and earliest 20th century was a period of mustaches. This was, this was, you know, it, it's funny when you get into things like gender. I don't know today that's, you know, the, the big topic today, but it is interesting historically how gender has changed. And of course, gender um, doesn't mean sex, you know, biology, it, it's culture. And so, you know, what makes you a man, you know, and it's funny when I was younger, especially when my parents were younger in the fifties, you know, if you had long hair as a man and, you know, that was, that was wimpy, that was sissy, you know, although the founding fathers all wore ponytails. Well, so every generation changes what they consider to be normal. Well, late 1800s and especially in the early 20th century for men, you were pretty much expected to have a mustache. And if you think of the military today, what do you think of? You think of uh, when you think of men in the military, you think of shaved heads and you see clean shaven. In fact, like I said, it's 2020 for anybody who might be listening to this a little bit later. It's 2020 and there has been some conversation in the last year or two in the U.S. military of maybe allowing beards and mustaches. And people are like, no, oh my God, that goes against military values. But actually think of Civil War. Everybody had a beard. 
It used to be the beard was a sign of being masculine. Um, well, by World War One, U.S. military, uh, British military, German military, Austrian military, everybody had a mustache. That's what you wore. Uh, and in fact, most men had a mustache. And, you know, they, there, there were, you know, technology, if you will, uh, to accommodate that. that. This was something that you could put on your uh, your cup, it's like like if you're a Briton, you're going to drink your cup of tea. Uh, you don't want to get all messed up uh, and have tea or coffee dripping off your mustache. So you have this mustache guard. And this is you can still find these in antique stores today. Actually, I think they sell them today as kind of for hipsters. <laughs> but in fact, I could probably use one of these. But uh, these, these are all antique from the early 20th century. And there were other weird in inventions. This was a night guard. So, you know, like. Franz Ferdinand, you got this really nicely waxed mustache. You don't want to do that every day. So this was, uh, and it's funny because <laughs> I'm actually acting this out, even though nobody can see me. But you, but you put this on your mustache and tie it behind your head, as you can see. And this is actually from the patent office. This is, you know, the official patent for it. And that's supposed to hold your mustache in place at night. So you notice, <laughs> I just muffled my voice, got to put my hand over my mouth. Anyway, this is supposed to hold your mustache in place so it doesn't get messed up every night. You know, what I usually ask in class is, you know, why did we start becoming clean shaven in the military? And uh, some of it is psychological. They have learned in the 20th century that by making everybody look exactly the same, there, there is a sense you're no longer individual, you're part of a machine, you're a cog in a wheel, uh, and that's necessary in war. Um, but at the same time, why specifically? Uh, because back then, the military, U.S. military, British military, German, you had to have a mustache to be in the military. It was like required. The reason it went away was because of World War I and specifically because this was a period where gas masks, and we're gonna get into that in a moment, when gas masks were being used and you wanted a good seal, you didn't want any leakage and hair on your face could provide leakage. So this is when they started clean shaving. Um, and then, of course, later they thought, oh, this has a good psychological effect because, you know, no longer are you going to have an individual. We want you to think of it as part of a unit. So anyway, way too much about mustaches. So Franz Ferdinand and his nice, handy mustache uh, put him to the side for a moment. Let's talk about the other part of that match that is struck. Gavrilo Prenchip, who was, uh, again, it, it's shocking. Uh, that we're talking about this guy in a way. He was 19 at the time. Uh, really, it was kind of a, a literal nobody. And again, another argument we often have in history is, you know, is, is history really the history of individual men and women, you know, great people, you know, and, and a lot of times we do tend to talk about, you know, kings or a president or something like that. Or is history broader than that? You know, what about the rest of us? And of course, the reality is history is a little bit of both. Uh, there are times where, and I would say most of the time, history is really the history of ideas and movements of people. And, and again, it's kind of like that pattern of pixels that create a photograph. You know, what you're looking at to, right now, it's really a bunch of pixels, but we're looking at it from a distance and you put them all together. And, oh, it makes a, a photograph. It makes an image. I think that is most of history. However, there are plenty of times where individuals do matter. Uh, we've talked about Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation, for instance. Um, this is another example. Gavrilo Princip, uh, this 19-year-old, I hate to say it, but, but was a terrorist. I mean, he would have considered himself a terrorist. This terrorist, with one action, completely, again, completely changed history. So who is this guy and why, why does he suddenly matter? He was a Bosnian Serb. And, and what he was originally was part of, you know, his people, his, his background was part of the Ottoman Empire that controlled Eastern and Southern Europe. And he specifically was part of an ethnicity, a culture that we call Slavs, Slavic peoples. In fact, it's where we in English get the word slaves from. 
um, because it was very common for Western Europe and, and Muslims in the Middle East to actually go to Eastern Europe back in the before the 1500s, capture people as slaves. And, and in the English language, Slav just became synonymous with a slave. Oh, you're from Eastern Europe. Oh, you're clearly a slave, you know. Uh, so he was a Slavic of, of Slavic heritage and he wanted to be a, f a free. He wanted a f to be, you know, he, he thought himself as a freedom fighter and he and several groups joined a group called the Black Hand. It was hardly anybody in this, but they considered themselves freedom fighters. They had, you know, as and historically they had been part of this Muslim empire. Now they are part of an Austro-Hungarian empire. And they don't want to be a part of that. And so he's going to be the one who assassinates Franz Ferdinand, not because he cared about Franz Ferdinand, but because Franz Ferdinand represented imperial rule. And he wanted to strike out against imperial rule. So again, here is, you'll see this map a couple of times. As you can see, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there, uh, I think Germany's right above it. Uh, they're, they're, they'll basically end up becoming one big empire at some point. But as you can see, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire dips down all the way, you know, into Siberia. And then over to the right, you see what says Turkey and then in parentheses, Ottoman Empire. That Ottoman Empire used to control all of what's above it at one time. In fact, here is the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Empire, even going back initially before we even began this class. But this was at its height in the late 1600s. You can see it's all of Northern Africa. It's what we now call the Middle East, but you can see it's a huge part of Eastern and Southern Europe. There are even parts of, of Russia and such. And again, where it says Sofia, that's, I mean, you're, you're, this is the area that we're talking about here. But by the time we get to World War I, as you can see, the Ottoman Empire has very much shrunk. It is a fraction of what it used to be. And it used to be known as the sick man of Europe. It was the weak empire. It was shrinking. And this is partly what's inspiring Germany and Austria-Hungary, you know, to start getting aggressive. As I said earlier, uh, Germany had just built a railroad in 1911 connecting them with the Middle East. And they were able to do this because the Ottoman Empire was so weak at this point. And, you know, again, European powers are like, yes, we can, we're going to carve this up. And this also gets into another issue. And this is something that we, the United States, have had to deal with. When you have a very powerful empire or even have a very powerful dictator, a, a, a harsh leader, and then you remove that leader. The people who have been, been oppressed, they're now rising up and they have their own issues. The reason I say the U.S. is because I, in, in our lifetime, um, even though some of you weren't quite born when this started, but after 9-11, we in the United States went into Iraq and we're not going to get into whether we should have or not. That's a huge political argument. But we went into Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein, a very oppressive, horrible dictator. But when we did that, what we ended up doing is unleashing a lot of internal conflicts because there's groups called the Sunnis, groups called the Shiites, and groups called the Kurds who were all uh, fighting with each other. And we lifted the lid uh, on that conflict. And we've been fighting that conflict ever since. We see the same thing happening with the Ottoman Empire. This Ottoman Empire used to kind of keep all these different peoples, all these different Slavic peoples and these other ethnicities that all, you know, were all part of one empire. But now that the empire is shrinking, they're, right, they're, they're starting to assert their own ethnicity. You know, I don't want to be a part of a culture with those people. So ethnic uh, conflict and racial conflict and religious conflict starts to rise in the early 1900s. And Gavrilo Princip, it's part of that. And so and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire kind of come in and go, oh, we're going to we're going to be in charge now. Not realizing basically that they're that they're in a, a you know a, a hotbed a, a, a cauldron if you will, 
And that's sort of what happens. So again, that's why I said earlier, it, it is kind of the timing of a lot of this. So back to these guys. So Gavrilo uh, is trying to free his peoples. And what he's hoping to do is unite all these different Slavs together because you have Christian Slavs and you have Sunni Slavs and you have Shiite Slavs. So they're fighting each other. He and his guys, they're hoping to bring all of them together uh, to, to unite to fight uh, the imperialists. First it was the Ottomans, now it's going to be uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now again, they were just a few people, uh, kind of a joke really. I mean, again, I mean, when I say few, I mean like five. I mean, it really is a small little group of people. They manage to get some guns, they train, and then they hear that Archduke Franz Ferdinand, because, you know, again, they had just been taken over by this empire. They find out that he and his wife are going to be, in 1914, they're going to be showing up in Sarajevo, and they're going to, you know, just kind of see their new empire. Oh, okay, this is the new land we just took over. Great, we're going to look it over, and then we're going to go back home. They're going to meet with the mayor of the town. We're going to have lunch and they're going to leave. And they go, oh, this is it. This is our chance to take over and, and, and to not take over. Excuse me. This is our chance to make a move and to, uh, you know, make a statement. We are going to kill Franz Ferdinand. And I, you know, this will spark an uprising. And that part didn't work. It was, in fact, in many ways, what it was trying to do was a complete disaster. Um, but obviously it had uh, larger implications, unexpected implications, if you will. Okay, so Franz Ferdinand is, you know, again, this was, he, he rides by train and then a local car picks him up with, you know, he's got a driver and they're gonna drive him th just in this car and they're gonna drive him through town and they're, you know, they're gonna then meet uh, with the mayor, and he's going to have lunch and give a speech, and then he's going to go home. That's it. It's just a simple visit. So he arrives in town, and he drives into. This is not exactly when this happened, uh, but he but he goes down the main drag, going across, you know, next to the river, and uh, Gavrilo and his fellow Black Hand members. They have a bomb. They're initially, they have guns, but they're, you know, handguns. But the original plan really was just to throw a bomb into the car, blow it up. And they throw the bomb and it they miss the car and it actually blew up a car behind them. So it was this major event, but he was fine. You know, Franz Ferdinand did not get killed. So they arrive at the, the city hall and he's furious. He's like, hey, what the hell? I just arrived in town. You guys tried to kill me? And the mayor is apologizing, no, that's not us, that's somebody else, we don't know what happened. And he was supposed to give a speech, he refuses to give it. He's like, I'm not talking to you guys. But they, they do calm him down, they say, we, we at least have lunch, and okay. So they have lunch, and basically the plan is, we're gonna get back in the car, and we're just gonna go head right back to the train station. We're not, we're not gonna go all over town and checking it out, we're just gonna head right to the train station, and we're out of here. So he has lunch, they get, he and his wife get back in the car. That's what you see here. And the plan was the car was just gonna keep going and get to the train station. The driver, however, was not told that plans had changed. So he, and this is what this, uh, this photograph of, he was supposed to keep going, but he ended up taking a left turn or excuse me, I guess from his photo, it would be a right turn uh, and going in the middle of town. And that's exactly what it is. He, he, this is right before that happens. He takes the right turn. Um, when he does, Franz, excuse me, Gavrilo Prancip was literally sitting on a curb with his handgun in his hand. He's got his hand and his, his head in his hands. And he's just thinking, basically, I can't believe this. You know, we had one chance, we screwed it up. This is ridiculous, I'm a nobody. And he looks up and coming right down the road is the car with Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And he can't believe it. And he, and he just stands up, he stands in the middle of the street, lifts his gun and fires and shoots and kills Franz Ferdinand. 
And then this is a photograph of them, of, of the surrounding people grabbing. Uh, and you can see him there on the right, uh, kind of looking down. That's him being grabbed uh, by the locals and the police. And eventually he's tried. He's, uh, you know, and he's taken to prison. And actually, he's going to live for four years. He dies in prison at 23. He dies of tuberculosis, in fact. And it's interesting, again, thinking of history and how we remember history. Again, in the U.S., for instance, we, we debate a lot about the Civil War and how to remember it. Are they heroes? Are the Confederates heroes? Are they villains? You know, we're not the only country that does that. And in fact, this is an interesting thing. Gavrilo Princip, is he a hero? Is he a villain? Is he a terrorist? Is he a freedom fighter? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, that's the answer, depending on when you ask and who you ask. So, for instance, you know, uh, for years and years and years, there were two footprints in the street where about where he would have stood. And people used to go and stand there, you know, and again, depending on whether you are Austrian or Serbian or Croatian or Bosnian or Christian or Muslim or, you know, I mean, is this a horrible guy that started one of the worst wars of all time? Or was he an anti-imperialist freeing his people? Uh, and, you know, and when he died, some people thought uh, a freedom fighter died. And, and it still changes, even to this day, how he is remembered. But getting beyond just Gavrilo and Franz Ferdinand. I mean, that was literally just the match that led to this major war. So who's to blame for this war? And this is something that even I, you know, since I've been teaching, which hasn't been quite, I guess it's been 16 years I started teaching, this I've changed in how I explain this, and most historians are beginning to change, I think. Um, the traditional viewpoint is that it's almost impossible to assign blame, you know, that uh, it, it was this confusing war that in some ways everyone was partly uh, responsible for. And there's some truth to that. But really, um, I think more and more as we're beginning to look at this from the distance of time, we're beginning to realize that yes, there, everyone, there is plenty of blame to go around. But at the same time, there may be one country that we can blame more than others. And it used to be very un unpopular to blame this country. Uh, but now I think we can probably say, no, really, they are more to blame than others. And that, frankly, it's Germany. You know, for years and years, when I was in high school and in college, the argument was we always blame Germany for this and we shouldn't have. And because we blamed them, that led to Hitler and that led to World War II. And I'm going to make some of that argument today in, in the next lecture. But at the same time, no, actually, there does seem to be one country that was excessively aggressive. And that was indeed Germany. Before we get there, though, we could actually blame this woman, Queen Victoria who became queen, uh, you know, goes all the way back to the 1830s. She actually lived uh, until 1903 when she passed away. And yet uh, she actually, uh, I, I'm being facetious here, uh, but this Queen Victoria of England, uh, one of the greatest monarchs in English history, um, actually played a pretty big role, role in World War I in some ways. Um, it's funny, most Americans, we say the term Victorian. I know Thomas Hill does a Victorian Christmas. And of course, Victorian just means uh, something that comes from the time period of Queen Victoria, which is most of the 1800s, right? And she's kind of quite popular in the U.S. over uh, the last few years. There's been several different versions of, uh, like, Jenna Coleman has played Queen Victoria on, on the TV show Victoria. Judy Dench, named Judy Dench, has played her, I think, at least twice, maybe even three times in various movies. She won an Oscar for one of her performances. Uh, Emily Blunt has also played her uh, in, in, in a really great film called Young Victoria. So she's been pretty well known to American audiences. What may not be as well known is she did have a massive family. And then her kids will go on, you know, they're all royals and then they married other royals. And of course, what's interesting about World War I is that the war began, you know, with Europe and Europe was controlled by kings and queens. 
by the end of World War I, even though those kings and queens were still around, they were no longer in charge anymore. World War I is kind of when Europe switched. I mean, they already had politicians and such, but it switched where royalty was less important and the prime ministers and people like that became more important. But when we began this war, almost every major country in Europe were related. The kings and queens were all related and they could all trace themselves back to Queen Victoria. And it, it is this strange phenomena where it was in a weird way, a family squabble. And here is, you know, the family tree, Albert and Victoria. And then, you know, you look down at the bottom there and you got Tsar Nicholas II, you got George V in, in England, you got Kaiser Wilhelm II, you know, like, oh my gosh, they literally all related all these, you know, Russia, England, and Germany, uh, these three major powers were all ruled by the same family. And actually gets a little more detail now when you really start going further down into cousins and such. But Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser, of course, is the German word for Caesar. And of course, Caesar uh, was a word that often was just used to refer to king, uh, czar, as in Tsar Nicholas II. I mean, that's, that comes from the same source as well. But Kaiser Wilhelm II um, really is kind of, I think, it, it, the, the aggressor here, much more than I think people have wanted to admit. He um, he was Queen Victoria's grandson, and that seems to, to some degree, gave him this, not to get too much into psychology, but his motivation, if you will, to defeat and maybe even take over the United Kingdom himself, because he's like, that's what my grandmother did. I'm going to do uh, the same thing. And again, what's really interesting, he was without a doubt um, determined uh, to fight this war. You know, he wanted Germany to be the major power, you know, and again, you, United Kingdom was the biggest empire. But as I mentioned earlier, what's really interesting is that he almost couldn't recognize that he didn't need war. He was kind of already there. As I said earlier, um, Germany was dominating uh, Europe financially. They led in science and, and, and technology. He just couldn't see it. To him, um, he, all he saw was what he wasn't. Uh, he definitely was mentally unstable. He had violent uh, mood swings. He, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, in the lecture about imperialism, we talked about what is known today as Namibia, uh, but used to be known as German Southwest Africa. Um, that's where some of the first genocides. He was the guy ordering all of that. You know, groups like the Herero that were, you know, thousands, you know, just exterminated in death camps. That was Kaiser Wilhelm II. Um, Again, the, the traditional viewpoint, and I used to teach this when I first started teaching, was that you know Germany wasn't any worse than England was or, or France was. Uh, that they you know they were sort of called um, horrible things, and we we're going to get into propaganda in a moment. Propaganda was terrible in World War One, and it did make things worse. But a lot of what Germany was accused of doing, they were guilty of. Um, in fact. You know, they were not much different from the Nazis. You know, we always kind of hold up the no Hitler and the Nazis as like the ultimate villains. And nobody's like the Nazis. Actually, sadly, a lot of people were. Um, and a lot of the actions of Germany in the earliest 20th century weren't that different from the Nazis. We just, we don't see a Holocaust. I mean, that obviously changes the game. But as to Herrero, if a Holocaust happened, they'd be like, yep, may not have been quite as bad as, you know, 1945, but yep. Uh, he definitely had genocidal uh, leanings, if you will. He also had a lot of ambitions that really weren't that different from Adolf Hitler. As you can see at the bottom there, it says, believed in personal rule. What that means is it's somebody where the entire state, the entire country is represented by him. 
we're going to get more into this when we talk about fascism, which is a whole kind of new way of organizing things. But this is kind of an early version of fascism. He personally chose all his military leaders, if you will. And if they didn't show absolute loyalty to him, he would get rid of them, uh, even executing some of him. And once the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, Kaiser Wilhelm was like, this is my moment. You know, his plan was in 40 days, I'm going to control much, much of Europe. He was going to go through Belgium and then attack France and cause them to surrender. He also was going to take over the Austro-Hungarian Empire and then have his way with the Middle East. I mean, he was incredibly aggressive in this war in a way that I think um, has been forgotten about uh, over the years because it, we're so quick to blame the United States and France and England for the end of this war, and they definitely have some blame to, to assume, but we, it's almost overshadowed the actual actions of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And again, what his plan was, as you can see Germany there, uh, you see Belgium, which was a neutral country, and the plan was, and, and was to go through Belgium to get to France. And in fact, his... Uh, army chief of staff with a guy named Helmut Moltke. And he kind of came up with this plan, you know, for, at the at the insistence of Kaiser Wilhelm to, uh, again, go into Belgium and such. And what they didn't realize was Belgium, a neutral country, had a very strong connection with the United Kingdom. And so not realizing that going into Belgium was actually going to bring the United Kingdom into this war. Um, so a lot of ineptitude is going to be involved here. So let's go ahead. I, I, again, I don't mean to spend so much time on this. Let's go ahead and just very quickly uh, just kind of talk about these steps to war. So June 28th, 1914, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated by Gavrilo uh, Princip uh, right there, the guy pictured there, a, a monument that has been destroyed and then rebuilt, <laughs> destroyed and rebuilt as uh, opinions of them have changed. With that, um, the chancellor of Germany, uh, who was under, uh, of course, Kaiser Wilhelm II, um, basically, uh, you know, and Kaiser Wilhelm II was really the one going, you know, do this. So basically, uh, the Chancellor of Germany offered Austria absolute support, what we traditionally call a blank check. And this is you know, just a dumb thing. But Germany basically said, hey, Austria, you know, you you know, your guy got killed, man. You need to you need to take revenge. You know, you you need to be all over this. And whatever you guys do, we got your back. And again, that's what we call it, a blank check. You do whatever you want. We got you. I mean, Germany was the main power. You know, you had them in. If you had them on your side, you could do whatever you want. So again, as you can see, Germany is the one. Even though this Gavrilo kind of starts all this, it's Germany that's taking advantage of it. Um. So Austria offers an ultimatum to Serbia. Hey, Serbia, you know, it's, it's your guy that killed our guy. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to take care of this. You know, you need to surrender to us, you know. And what they basically said was, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't turn it, we're going to declare war on you. And that's exactly what they do. Five days later, Austria declares war on Serbia. And of course, Germany's behind them going, yeah, keep doing it. That causes Russia, because Russia has a lot of ambitions in South or Eastern Europe. And now they're like, whoa, whoa, what's up with Austria? They're, no. So they start to mobilize. They're, they're ready to go to war. And so because of that, and because Germany and Austria have this agreement, Germany then goes, all right, you know, thank you, Russia. You did exactly what we wanted. So they declare war on Russia on August 1st. And what's, as you can see, what's already beginning to happen is all these major powers are all going to war with you. Now, what England wants initially is going all the way back to 1815. They are all about maintaining balance of power. They're not really trying to take over people, but they don't want any one power getting too powerful. And that's what's starting to happen. 
So then Germany, again, remember they have this plan to go through Belgium and into France. They basically give an ultimatum to Belgium. You surrender to us and you'll live or we're going to go to war with you. And that's when the United Kingdom now gets involved, the largest empire. Um, even though your, Germany may have more money and better technology, but they were still the king of the hill. And the United Kingdom Prime Minister, As Herbert Asquith, um, basically said no you're not doing that belgium is our ally they're neutral we need belgium they're kind of our main port into europe no you can't do that if you do that if you do anything with belgium that will be war with us and his uh chancellor of war well, was a guy named edward gray that's the guy you see pictured here um He basically tells the United Kingdom, look, uh, we cannot allow this to happen. Uh, you know, just like any other country, United Kingdom, um, you know, they had more than one. They had the conservatives, they had the liberals. I mean, that was the actual name of their parties. And, um, you know, liberals were very anti-war at this point. And he gets a speech. He says, hey, guys, this isn't a normal time. We got to stop Germany. If we don't stop Germany now, we're going to be in big trouble later. And he literally changed history with this speech because he suddenly convinces people in England to be like, yeah, yeah. So if Germany doesn't stop, we're ready for war. And the same day as that speech, Germany officially declares war, not just on Belgium, but on France, this large, the other major power of Europe. And the next day they invade Belgium ready to go right into France. And at that moment, the United Kingdom declared war. And this is an actual headline from the New York Times. England declares war in Germany. British ships sunk. French ships defeat German. Belgium attacks 17 million men engaged in a great war. That's where that phrase comes from. A great war of eight nations. Great England. You know, it's, it, it, it's like, this is really a headline. In fact, the Onion a few years ago made a, a a fake version that almost looks like the real version. This is the fake onion version. It's almost identical. But if if you are into World War One, especially if, if, you know if you're British, you know Belgium um, is, is sort of what everyone always remembers. A uh, Flanders Field, which of course there was a very famous poem by a Canadian soldier about Flanders Fields. Um, it Flanders really became initially was the symbol of Germanic horrors, but later kind of became the symbol of just the horrors of war. Um, the symbol of anti-war is the poppy. And not so much in the US, although occasionally people do this here, but in throughout Europe, especially in England, partly because of this poem in Flanders Fields, uh, this has become the symbol for anti-war, for peace. This is at the Tower of London um, in 2014. So the 100th anniversary of, of this battle in Belgium. And they flooded uh, all over the Tower of London, all around it were these flowers. They're fake, but these flowers. And it's very common for people to wear these on November 11th. And, um, and it's because of the poem, because what happened is after this horrible battle, um, these flowers within a day or two actually, you know, started blooming. And not only are they beautiful, but they're also blood red. And so this, you know, out of death comes life, out of blood, you know, comes renewal. And so it became this, you know, even with a war, we can have peace. We can, you know, just because there's been horrible things doesn't mean something beautiful can't come out of it. Um, but it, again, it, what happened to Belgium, which is, again, for most people outside of, at least most Americans, it's rather unknown. You know, August 25th, uh, the university uh, was completely destroyed. But August 30th, 2,000 buildings in Belgium were completely destroyed. Uh, entire towns were destroyed. And a lot of times in some of these towns, every civilian in town murdered, killed. Again, this wasn't just... This wasn't just an invasion. This was a destroying Belgium. You know, again, this is Kaiser Wilhelm II and this viewpoint of absolute destruction. Um, 
But to be fair, some of the propaganda we hear is even worse than the reality. So this, you know, Gavrilo Princip and these diplomatic maneuvers, and then finally the invasion of Belgium, which leads to everybody else joining the war, um, sparks a, a four-year war. Um, we call it the Great War officially, but we can also call it the Great Slaughter. Um, 40 million casualties. A casualty means you're, you're out of commission. You can't, uh, you can't fight. You're sick. You're injured. That's what we mean by casualty. And actually, I should have 10 plus million deaths there. We actually think the number might be a little bit higher than what I have here. Um, at least 60 million soldiers ended up fighting this war. And even though most of the actual fighting did indeed happen in Europe, we do see it in the Middle East and Africa, but most of the actual bullets being fired were in Europe. But they were often fired by Africans, often fired by Asians. Um, we, and this is something, again, we do forget, you know, over a million Indians fought, you know, in other words, from India ended up fighting in Europe, you know, in the British Empire. Um, French Africans, British Africans, German Africans also fought in this war. So, you know, again, this was a world war. Although it didn't involve the Americas so much, although ultimately, it, well, excuse me, actually, I'm lying, because it involved Canada quite a bit. Um, Canadian soldiers were, because at that point, Canada was still very much a part of the British Commonwealth. And so British uh, Canadian soldiers were fighting. Um, but eventually it also will involve the United States as well. But this really was a, a war unlike what we've seen before. And even though civilians have always been targeted in, at some point in history, um, in Europe and in you know, the United States, there were rules to war. Things like the Geneva Conventions, where we don't do certain things in war. Uh, and you're not supposed to blow up hospitals. You're not supposed to attack women and children. You're not, you know, you're not supposed to attack a town. And even though Germany may have been the first country to do this, everybody is doing this in this war. And, and it, 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 this is when we start to really get into what we might call total war, which unfortunately is how war is fought today. Everyone, including the United States, we're constantly bombing cities and, and doing things, you know, which was unheard of before World War I. And so much of this also gets into new types of weaponry. This really was the first major war in over 40 years. The last time there was a major war before World War I was 1871, the Franco-Prussian War, the French and German War. And even that was a relatively small war. There were some other, you know, there were imperial wars, you know, things happening in Western Africa or the, the Russian-Japanese War of 1905. Uh, there was the Boxer Rebellion in China. Uh, there was a rebellion in India, but these are all small little wars and usually were a superior military force against a very undermanned, under-armed uh, uh, colonial force. So there hadn't been a major, really true war in 40 years, which means not only are your soldiers, which are you know anywhere from 16 to 25, you know obviously they weren't alive for these previous wars, but most of the officers, people who are in their 30s and 40s, they weren't even alive. In fact, most of the leaders, including most of the political leaders, weren't around for that war. So that's something to also keep in mind. This is a war fought by people who had never been in war before. And you know one of the things that um, happens with World War One, and I really meant to say this at the beginning, Europe was quite cocky, uh, and, and the United States as well. You know, they really began to think of themselves as truly superior to everybody else. We white people are superior to all these savages. This is something we talked a little bit about with imperialism. There is this sense, they're the barbarians. They're the savages. We're civilized. We don't fight wars anymore. We may have to you know, beat up some colonials because they don't know any better, but we don't fight each other anymore. We fight through medicine. We fight through technology. We fight through economies. We don't have to fight like barbarians anymore. We're above that. Nope, turns out they weren't. And I think this is a lesson for us nowadays. You know, it's been 70 years since the last major war. And I think we do have kind of gotten complacent. I think we think, well, war's not ever gonna happen again. We're above that. And it does seem like we're better than we used to be on that. Um, 
I, I hope I'm wrong, but I do think it's just a matter of time before we see yet another major war. I think the only reason we haven't seen a major war actually has to do with atomic weapons. But that's another conversation for a later lecture, but we'll get into that later. But to some degree, the level of, of destruction is also these new technologies, new technologies that didn't even exist in the Franco-Prussian War. So not only do you have all these, um, to some degree, rather untrained soldiers, uh, because a lot of the war is fought by people who were drafted into the war, so they're literally being trained very quickly and thrown into this war. They don't really know what they're doing. And, but you also have leaders and officers who are using new weapons they don't know what they're doing because they've never used these weapons before. They, they didn't exist. Um, this is the first war in a major way to, to use air warfare. I say that because technically during the Civil War, there were some hot air balloons that went up, but they, they didn't really do anything. But this is the first war where we see airplanes, even though in the big picture, the airplanes don't do a whole lot. But at the same time, they do play a role here. They did drop bombs over cities. And when I say that, it really means the pilot is flying and that he grabs a bomb from between his legs and, hang, and literally reaches over outside of the plane and just drops them with his hand. It was that primitive. Uh, and of course, dropping bombs, uh, even today, uh, even with all of our precision weapon, weaponry, and it is quite amazing what bombs can do, even today, um, as many as 70% of bombs and rockets don't hit their target. We know that from drones. Drones most of the time don't hit what they're aimed at. Uh, air warfare has always been sloppy and it continues to be sloppy even in 2020, even though we're much more precise than we used to be. Uh, and of course, uh, if you study military history, one thing you learn is that air warfare almost never wins a war. In fact, it almost always prolongs the war because it always kills a lot of civilians and does a lot of damage. And it actually makes makes people even angrier and they fight even more. Uh, the other major type of weapon in, in, is at the bottom there. The photograph itself is from the 30s, but these great giant Zeppelins, you know, think of uh, the blimp, like the Goodyear blimp, you know, these, uh, which were, you know, the, could, could also not only spy on enemy, but they could also drop bombs. But they also had, they were full of uh, flammable gas. So they could, so if you shot them with a gun, that they could actually cause more destruction by coming down flaming. Another one, um, and this is where I have to actually glance at my notes, because again, I'm not much of a weaponry guy. I'm not somebody to talk much about guns or anything. This was, um, a gun that a German gun that was nicknamed Big Bertha. Big Bertha was you know, usually used in the military. It just meant something really big. And Bertha, of course, has this nice Germanic sound to it. Uh, it referred to a very specific type of gun, uh, a gun built by the Krupp's Arms Company. It was a 42 centimeter um, long barrel gun that could be, you know, move. You know, had, it could, it could be, it was mobile. It could be moved around. It was technically a German siege howitzer, howitzer, just think cannon, basically. Uh, it was just, a, in other words, it wasn't quite a rocket. Rocket technology would not be invented until uh, World War II, although it was invented by the Germans. Again, almost all the major weaponry in World War I and much of the weaponry in World War II were actually invented by the Germans because, again, they were the leaders of science and technology for a long time, especially at military technology. And so this is Big Bertha refers to a very specific gun. But throughout the First World War, you are beginning to see all sides have some versions of these guns, these large artillery, these large cannons that could have a range of miles. This particular gun had a range of a little over 30,000 feet, which is just under six miles. Uh, some of the other guns in this war would have a range close to 10 miles. So think about that. Um, and this is again before, you know, GPS and satellites and, and you know, you were firing blind. And this is gonna, you know, cause what I'm interested in is not so much your weaponry, but why was this war so violent? Um, and, you know, we've already looked at imperialism. We know the, the rise of racism and the rise of looking at other peoples as though they're subhuman to you. That There's an element of that. But a lot of it is just specifically this technology. So you're going to fire in your enemy miles away. You can't even see them. Maybe you have somebody on the ground, you know, communicating with you and you you're, you're trying to blow up 
uh, you know, a tank, or you're trying to blow up the headquarters. And so you shoot the cannon off and you blow up a school. And so the person on the ground says, go to the left. So you shoot another cannon, you know, another bomb off, and you blow up a, a local church. And they go, no, go back to the right. And maybe after a few attempts, you finally hit your target, but you've done all this damage and you've killed all these people before you even get to your actual target. The other thing about air warfare and this long range cannon warfare, I think gets into another phenomena about war. In fact, I'm gonna stay on this slide for, for a little while. So um, I think a theory that I operate on as far as history is concerned is that when war becomes more impersonal, it becomes more destructive. Because one of the biggest conundrums of human history is we seem to be getting smarter throughout the 20th century. And yet war gets so much more destructive. Again, over 10 million in this war, we're talking 70 million in World War II. By the end of that war, we humans have invented a weapon that could destroy every human on earth. How can we do this when we're supposed to be getting smarter? We seem to be killing each other better. But some of it does seem to be the fact that we can kill from a distance. You know, and this is why I think a lot of us don't like drones to some degree. There's something about that impersonal nature of it. If I was to ask you, and I usually do in class, if I was to ask you, okay, you have to kill somebody. You don't have a choice. You have to kill somebody. But you can choose how to kill them. So, you know, I can give you a knife and you have to go to the person. You have to stab, you know, you have to kill them. And by the way, they're going to have a knife too. And you're, you know, it's going to be face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and you're going to be trying to cut their throat, cut their eyeball out, stab their heart, cut their guts out, and they're going to be doing the same thing to you. So not only is it you're, you're going to hear them, you're going to smell their blood, you're going to hear them cry. By the way, uh, I interviewed uh, when I was a grad student a lot of veterans of war. You know what the most common thing that people say in war? You know, the last words, if they say anything. You know, movies, that's always, tell my wife I love her. You know, no, that never happens in real life. Um, but the most common thing that, that a soldier will say before they die is mommy or some version of mommy. You're dying, you're cold, you're scared. You re and most of the time that you're talking 18, 19 year olds anyway, they're already young. They revert back to, to wanting to just hold, have their mommy hold them, and which is, and, and I've interviewed several veterans that say the same thing. They, they can remember just hearing people, just grown men crying. And a lot of them are saying, mommy, mommy, mommy. Uh, so you, you, you have to hear that before they take their last breath. Or, or you have a butt that you can just push this button and they die. You don't have to see them. You have to hear them. Now, every so often I'll ask that, and there are always somebody in class, it's almost always a guy, no offense guys, but it's almost always a guy go, oh, I'd take the knife because it's tougher. You know, like, okay, that's somebody who's never actually had to do this in real life. Uh, but the best way to fight, of course, is to not actually fight. I mean, you know, <laughs> the last thing you want to actually do is fight. And of course, um, you know, it's always somebody who's never, you know, really been around war that wants to kill. You know, once you actually go to war, you don't want to kill. And anybody who's ever been in war will tell you they're haunted by it for the rest of their lives. Uh, but but most people, especially if you know they're not trying to show off, would of course just want to push the button. Nobody wants to kill anybody. We're not psychopaths. And in a way, something like a Big Bertha, dropping a bomb from an airplane, later shooting rockets, um, shooting an atomic bomb, flying a drone, it's kind of that. You're killing people, but you aren't directly doing it. There's there's a distance between you. There's an emotional distance. And what's interesting, I think historically speaking, is um, it, it begins to take the morality out of the decision-making because it's not quite so personal. And I do think we are seeing that more and more as we move into the 20th century. All right, I'll come back to that concept a little bit later. We also get into things like mechanized warfare, in particular tanks, where, you know, we have jeeps we have cars we have motorcycles we're on the move we can move quicker we also have uh, germans developed this initially called u-boat boats uh, which means unter water boats underwater boats we would call them submarines um 
You also get the first real submachine guns. I mean, technically, even the Civil War had a machine gun, but these are it wasn't until World War One that you get something that's actually effective. And again, these are, are guns that could shoot, you know, literally 100 bullets in less than a minute. And so, if you're well protected and you have enough bullets, you could sit there and mow down hundreds of soldiers. Especially if you're housed in something like this, what was called a pillbox, whether it's steel reinforced or maybe just steel or steel reinforced concrete, you know, in a, in a good place like this. And, and in fact, I'll try to remember um, to post online a clip of um, a, from a movie called Saving Private Ryan, you know, that Second Second World War. Uh, it shows the 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 power of somebody in something like a pillbox with a machine gun, how much damage they can do. Just one person with one gun. Um, what I'm getting at is so much of this war, the weaponry was so effective at killing that you just, the numbers are just through the roof. And yet the way they're fighting this war is still 19th century technology. I mean, excuse me, techno techniques using 20th century technology, but kind of fighting. You know, they were using tanks the way cavalry would be used. Uh, they're using these machine guns, but they're in trenches, like like in the Civil War, not realizing that these new technologies can can you don't have to fight the old way. You can fight new ways. And so again, it's almost like giving a five year old a machine gun, you know. But the other new weapon. Um, that again was used in such a crude way was chemical warfare. And again, this is something German, Germany, they're not the only ones, but they're the ones leading the way. And people like Robert Koch, you know, these people discovering all these new, uh, not only discovering germs, but new chemicals and uses of chemicals. Um, this is probably the most famous image. You always see this image. Uh, this person had mustard gas. And again, you can see it causes these just awful, uh, blisters and it will kill you this person in this photo is going to die but it can take weeks before you finally die um so and, and again the question i often ask students is you know most people go oh yeah chemical warfare it's awful and of course the question i always ask is why is it so awful what's it's killings killings right putting a bullet in somebody's brain versus killing them with say mustard gas um but the reason I, I think we all agree there's something worse about this is because it does get into the inhumanity of it. The, there's a torture element. It doesn't just kill somebody. It kills them over weeks and weeks. Plus, there's an environmental impact of this. You know, these gases would be shot out of a canister, for instance, and then the wind changes. And so it doesn't just kill the soldiers. It might kill civilians. It might kill animals. It gets into the water. Um, it's very unpredictable. The first time Britain used chemical war, because by the way, everybody uh, blamed Germany for this because they started it, but then everybody else started using it. This is another, sorry, I'm, 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 uh, let me finish my story real quick. So England, the first time they used it, um, they, sh they, they took, you know, paid attention to the wind and the moment they shot off the canister, the wind switched and it blew it back on them and they all died. It's almost like a, like, like a bad cartoon, right? Um, but I was going to say another tragedy of weapons in humans is once you invent something, you use it. So let's say, you know, like, like, I can remember guys in high school, they're going to have a fight. Okay, three o'clock tomorrow, we're going to fight. And then they would actually come up with rules. Okay, man, don't, don't hit me in the face or don't hit me here. And, you know, you might agree to certain rules, like don't punch in the kidney. But then when you're fighting and you start losing, the first thing you do is go for the kidney, for instance. So... For instance, all these countries had these rules. We're not going to use chemical wars, you know, chemical weapons. I mean, in fact, in early 1900s, they, they had all agreed we're not going to use chemical weapons. And that was before chemical weapons were even that bad. But the moment you start losing the war, you start using it. In other words, you might put a weapon in a lockbox and agree you're never going to use it until you start losing. And the first thing you do is you pop over that box. It is, we see it over and over and over again in history. Somebody invents something, they say it's too terrible, we can't use it, and then they use it anyway. The only thing that that has not happened with is, again, the atomic bomb, after we used it. Anyway, um, so everyone's using chemical warfare, and again, this is killing, uh, has environmental impacts, it has civilian impacts, obviously it's killing soldiers. 
mustard. It's called mustard gas, by the way. It has nothing to do with mustard. It's just, it smells a little bit like garlic and a little bit like mustard. So it's the smell that gives it its particular name. Um, the Germans, um, just on July 12th, uh, Germans lopped 50,000 shells with mustard gas uh, at the French. It burns out your insides. Again, it causes these awful blisters. But you also got some of these other types of gas. And these are, again, various um, types of, of chemical weapons. Uh, you know, one causes nasal irritants and skin burns. Other ones basically like tear gas makes you uh, cry. It makes you vomit. Here's the mustard gas. Again, these are training video, uh, videos, good Lord, training posters to sort of give you a sense, like if you know it's coming to get out of the way. Uh, but some of these, like uh, phosgene, is absolutely deadly. Same as chlorine. So some of these gases, like tear gas, will just sort of um, d incapacitate you to fight, but others uh, absolutely kill you. And again, this is the type of thing, you know, you, you get this handle and you lob it and then you throw it and then it lands and it the, the metal breaks open and then the gas comes out. That's one of the ways these things were shot off. Uh, some of these were placed in guns and then you pull the trigger and it shoots the canister over a long way and then it and then it opens up. And again, these are this is a mustard gas showing some of those sores that could open up. And of course, one of the things about chemical warfare is you know the, very quickly they invent a gas mask again this is why facial hair quit being used in military uh, this is a world war ii image here uh but this the, the bad thing about chemical warfare is that if you know it's coming you put gas masks on um you can protect yourselves from the the you, you'll still feel it um but you'll you won't necessarily die from it but of course it's the civilians that will that don't have the gas mask and end up paying the ultimate price um and again here is um uh, you know, the, after the invention of the gas mask. And of course, even though Germany definitely um, earned some of their bad reputation, but we also see the leftover from imperialism and Darwin, social Darwinism coming into play here. So there is definitely this demonization of the enemy and using racial imagery to do this. This is, uh, I have it kind of cut off here, but this is the famous poster, a British poster showing the Hun. The Hun uh, was the nickname uh, for the Germans. It comes from the phrase Attila the Hun, the old invaders of Europe. Uh, and Kaiser Wilhelm II in the early 1900s was given a speech to the soldiers to put down the Boxer Rebellion in China. And he says, I want you to fight like the Hun. And it's a very famous speech. So during World War I, they become known as the Hun. And this is something else we see, the psychology of war. And that is this need to sometimes label your enemy with a, a term that makes you not think they're human. And, and this is, I mean, we kind of have to do this if we're going to fight a war. You can't think of your enemy as, you know, a, a fellow human that, that's, you know, that feels pain and has kids and has a parent, you know. We have to think of them as the enemy if, if, because we're not psychopaths and, and we have to be able to kill them. It's, when, it's why war is so awful. And so it's a lot of times using these kind of, um, really almost racial terms. And they usually tend to be one syllable, very, you know, you know, hun, uh, the wops, the gooks, the cowheads, uh, cowheads, or ragheads, uh, the japs, uh, the krauts, you know, the reds, um, you know, these very, so that you're, you are kind of dehumanizing them a little bit. By the way, this poster is so famous because some of you may know the num uh, the, the movie uh, King Kong. It actually was inspired by this poster. And again, uh, portraying the Germans as an ape, as animal. And of course, uh, you know it's a German because he's got the helmet with the pickle hob. And that's that little pointy thing at top. Pickle hob means boiled leather. They didn't actually wear helmets like this in World War One, but that was the symbol of a German. So you know it's a German soldier. Um, and of course, some of this does come from the horrible behavior in Belgium. Um, but but the propaganda went even further than reality. In fact, I'm going to post a couple of movie, short, like 30 second movies of Germans um, throwing babies out windows, which they never actually did that. Um, but this is showing, um, again, 
uh, Germans as an ape, and simian imagery has always been used to, to dehumanize somebody. Usually it's done in a racial way. Very often in uh, the United States during the time of segregation, African Americans were often portrayed as monkeys or apes. And and again, there is some, it, he's very dark here, and then he has a white woman who's partly naked, so there's this rape imagery here, there's this sexual imagery here. And a lot of that's coming even out of the United States and how they portrayed other races. So again, beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. Liberty Bonds were in the US and Britain. You, you could give basically give money to the government. Um, again, the, the Germans, they, they may pretend they're peaceful like the dove, but they're really a vulture. They're just pretending to be peaceful. You know, hun or home, you have a woman with her baby, and here is this dark, hulking, ape-like hun with his pickle hob in the background. But you can stop the hun from doing horrible things to that mother and her baby because the hun has bloody, murderous hands. So, um, this, just skip ahead to the end of the war. Uh, finally, the United States did indeed enter this war. Um, U.S. too, we get into it, but basically Germany threatened the U.S. with war. They weren't actually going to. They didn't want us in this war, but they teamed up with Mexico and said, hey, Mexico, why don't you attack the U.S.? They did it with a telegram called the Zimmerman Telegram, and we found out about it. Mexico, by the way, said no, but still. Um, and we declared war in Germany, and then um, it takes us a while to get ready, but in early 1918, we go into Europe, and by the fall of 1918, Germany is like, we, we, we can't do this. So November 11th, they agreed to, um, to basically halt the fighting. That's what's known as an armistice. It didn't actually mean that, um, they surrendered, and that's something to, th this is where we do, I think, sometimes, um, this is where I think the, the, the idea that Germany wasn't to blame for this war comes from, because they are definitely at blame for beginning this war, but they weren't treated as well as they probably should have been at the end of this war. And it is, it is important, I think, to remember that the armistice is not a surrender. So they agreed to an armistice. And, it, and they agreed that it would, you know, I mean, you know, the night before, basically tomorrow, which happened to be November 11th, in fact, specifically uh, at 10.45 a.m., although we always say it was 11 a.m., um, they agreed. And in fact, it was on this train in France where German and English and French leaders sat on the train and signed this agreement. Um, we always say it was at the 11th minute of the 11th hour, or the 11th day of the 11th month. It's not quite true, but it's close enough. And of course, we celebrate this uh, every year uh, as uh, Veterans Day, but in the rest of the world, it's known as Armistice Day. And this is when people wear the red poppies and such. And it does have huge long-term historical repercussions because after the war was over with and after the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was overly punished. And I, I'd still maintain that, even though I do think Germany is much more to blame than we give them credit for uh, or blame for, but they definitely were over punished. And that's going to allow for the rise of Hitler later. And when Hitler defeated France in 1940, he found that same train car, which no longer exists anymore. It has been destroyed, but he found that same train car and he forced the French to sign their terms of surrender in 1940 you know, kind of rubbing their face in it because you did that to us in 1918. Anyway, so the armistice is signed. The war for the moment is over, although it could flare back up. Luckily, it didn't. Uh, but now we got to resolve this thing. So, you know, Russia, excuse me, good Lord, uh, Europe, especially Belgium and France, absolutely destroyed. England, not so much. No real fighting there. Germany, not so much. There was some fighting Germany. Most of Germany was relatively untouched. And that's going to be important to remember. But parts of, of uh, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and parts of the Ottoman Empire and Northern Africa, but definitely France and Belgium, almost absolutely destroyed in this war. And these are a couple other images. I started this semester showing you some photographs of Albert Kahn. Uh, these are some photographs that his photographers took um, after World War I. 
So um, everybody goes home, they, they, you know, nobody knows quite what to do. And then uh, we get the Paris Peace Conference in early 1919. Um, and it, it starts again January 1919. Um, initially, it was going to be five main countries that ran it, uh, but it ultimately ended up being a four that ran it. So, the way it initially began was that Germany was not invited, which was, in hindsight, a major mistake. Germany should have been a part of this. You know, if you're going to have an argument with somebody and then you make up, you got to have the person you were arguing with to make up with. It's like if I and my wife got in an argument and then I, and then I said, okay. I've made up and I tell my wife, okay, I've made up and you have to do all these things. It's like, wait a minute, that's not making up because the other person has to also agree to this. And that's one of the problems with the end of World War One. The main person in this, Germany, wasn't a part of these negotiations. Initially, it was 37 nations, although they represented today nearly 200 countries. Um, you know, because so many of these countries were really part of, like, for instance, Canada was represented as being part of the United Kingdom. This was held in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But these four guys right here, you might recognize at least one of them. The guy on the right, obviously, is the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but these four guys basically ran um, this conference. So they were known as the Supreme Council. Now, initially there were five. Japan, another rising power, uh, kind of like Germany was a rising power. They were part of this, but it became very quickly apparent that they weren't going to have any real say. So they took a break at one point and Japan just never came back. They were like, we're done. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of resentment on Japan's part. And that's going to explain even something like Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor had a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons for Pearl Harbor was, and they were very upfront about it later, you insulted us at Versailles. Anyway, but these were really the four. It's funny, today, um, a lot of people will, um, you know, when you talk about the United Nations or something, they'll always be like, hey, you know, we don't want world government. And, you know, because I'm always like, well, why is world government bad? Of course, it's always revelations, and that's the, and, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, just because you have a world government doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be the end of the world. I mean, I always think of Star Trek, but I, the reason I always bring that up is because we really kind of had a world government already. You're looking at it right here, the Supreme Council. Pretty much for about a year, they pretty much ran the world, these four people who represented four different nations and the way they they would sit in a room and all the other nations would be called in and they would get about 20 minutes and they would tell these four guys what they wanted and why they should get it most of the time they wanted some money and they wanted some land um You know, for instance, uh, people, uh, Jewish representatives, they said they want the state of Israel. Uh, Arabs showed up. They said they want more land. Um, Australia said they want New Guinea. Um, Ho Chi Minh, the leader of what is now Vietnam, they, they, he showed up, but he wasn't allowed to speak. Um, but uh, they basically were a world government for all intents and purposes. So we've already had one almost 100 years ago. So who are these guys? Obviously, the, the one that we know the most, uh, President Woodrow Wilson. Um, I won't get into him too much. What US2, I talk a lot about him. I have to be honest, I'm, I'm biased. I'm not a fan of Woodrow Wilson <laughs> at all. And some of it is because of his behavior here. Um, he was a historian by training. He had been a professor. Then he became governor of New Jersey and then later obviously president elected in 1912 he was on his second term at this point he in one level he thought he was a good person uh he considered himself a progressive he wanted to make the world a better place unbelievably arrogant incredibly racist um in fact under president woodrow wilson the united states government becomes segregated uh he was very pro segregation for instance he had a messiah complex, literally. He literally thought his purpose in life was to save, literally save the world. He was going to, this war was going to be the war to end all war. And he was going to bring eternal peace. Not a bad goal, uh, but again, 
maybe just end this war. Maybe don't try to solve all the world's problems. And a lot of times in history, sometimes the worst things happen with people who, again, think they can do too much. So he did arrive with a plan, what is um, known as the 14 points. It was his, uh, again, his plan to bring world peace, not just peace to this war, but all peace. Um, and I do purposely use this language. It was a plan imposed on the world. Um, what, to, to back up a little bit, to be a little nicer to Wilson. First off, when Wilson arrived, people did love him. He was seen as a deity. You know, literally a million people showed up in France when he arrived by ship. They wanted to see the guy that saved Europe. Um, and you know, one phrase for him was he was a savior without a sword. He was a god of justice. Because one thing he did do that I think um, he does he should get more credit for, even from me, uh, is that he wanted to end this war with no revenge. So often in war, um, you go to war because you want something. You want some goodies at the end of it. And he was like, no. And, and it is interesting. The United States does walk away from this war with nothing. We didn't come into this war to get anything. And we don't get anything. And he wanted everybody to follow that. He failed at that. And we're going to see that in a few moments. That unfortunately, there was a lot of revenge going on. But his goal was not to have revenge. And I do think um, he does indeed... Uh, at least try that. And I do think he, I, 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 even I should, you know, I don't like the guy, even I should acknowledge that he did do that. Um, and one of the things that he did, I think is interesting is that um, he, he refused to visit any battlefield. People say, you got to see all the destruction. He says, I don't want to see it. If I go and I go to Belgium, for instance, I see all the horrible things that Germany did. I can't help but want to punish Germany. And I don't want to get caught up in the emotion of that. And I, I do think that is very smart. And I think he's right about that. He says, peace should not be made with emotion. Um, and, you know, he, again, was like, I am going to bring, uh, you know, logic to this, if you will. I'm going to, we're, we're going to do this right. But of course, he's very arrogant. And, and one of the things that happens is the other three guys are constantly praising him uh, and he falls for it. And so he gets suckered into a lot of things he shouldn't have got suckered into. Um, the leader of France, who, who we're about to talk about, he uh, he refused initially to speak French. He purposely spoke English in honor of Wilson. And like I said, Wilson thinks he's achieving all these great things, but really they, they recognized uh, this guy's very egotistical. If we just play upon his ego, we can get whatever we want. And that's exactly what ended up happening. But one of the things that he is going to create is something known as the League of Nations. And I'll, I'm going to talk more about this later. But these were basically some of his 14 points. He um, he says, one of the things I've studied the world and, and I realize that that a lot of peoples of the world need to be free. So we're going to create some new nations like Poland and Iraq and Czechoslovakia. Um, these, I, I purposely mentioned those three because World War II begins with the invasion of Czechoslovakia and Poland. Because the way he creates Poland and Czechoslovakia is basically carving up Germany, which is going to create a lot of anger at Germany. Iraq was putting together three groups of people that hated each other, Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds, and created this fake nation of Iraq. And of course, we, the U.S., paid the price in the 2000s by getting rid of Saddam Hussein. And oh, we were fighting uh, World War One battles. Then he also created some international laws, reduce arms, limit navies, have free trade, uh, free shipping, free determination, in other words, democracy. Nice ideas. They didn't work at this point, but these are nice ideas that we still aspire to today. And then, of course, uh, he wanted to create something he called the League of Nations. He said, "Of I will give you something better than just peace. I will give you a League of Nations. We've prepared for war and we've got it. Why don't we prepare for peace for a change? Um, and I will say, as somebody who runs the model United Nations Club, I know in 
2020. We didn't do much this year because I know one or two of you were interested in that. But uh, I'm somebody who, who definitely is interested in the United Nations. I think it's a good ideal. It's not a government, by the way. Um, and the League of Nations basically was an early version of that, and it absolutely could have worked. As we're going to see, it didn't, but it could have. So it in itself, it's not a bad idea. So again, he was coming here. I am going to give the world peace. And of course, the joke here is you have this dove of peace, but he's being given basically a log. And of course, that dove of peace can't fly with that, and it's going to come crashing down to Earth. Um, but we'll get into the League of Nations. I want to come back to this in a moment. So Germany, again, had no say in this. And when I talk about creation of new nations, this is what these new nations are going to be created of. You can see a big chunk of it is going to be to create Poland. You can see it on the right at the bottom. A big chunk of it is going to create Czechoslovakia. And then a chunk on the left side is going to be given to Belgium and to France. So they basically just carved up Germany. And that's going to cause a lot of anger in Germany. So uh, pay no attention to the AU there. That's a typo on my part. But Clemenceau... Um, was the second major leader. He was the leader of France, and he was known as the Tiger of France. He um, he was one of the main guys that actually did fight. As a young, young man, he fought in the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which again, a war against France versus Germany, and France lost that war. So keep in mind, he is coming into this ready to punish Germany for this. He is a very personal for him. And keep in mind that uh, France was absolutely destroyed in World War I. 20,000 factories gone, 500,000 homes destroyed, um, over 2 million livestock killed, 4,000 villages destroyed by Germany. So not only did he have a personal vendetta, uh, but the nation had a vendetta against him. Um, He's weighty. He wants revenge. And even though he admires Wilson on one hand, uh, he's not talking about this, this piece with no revenge. Uh-uh. No. Um, and, and his personal goal was to, was to circumnavigate Wilson's idealism. Um, he initially kind of liked Wilson, but, but quickly he ended up not liking him. He called him Jesus Christ, but not in a nice way. You know, got Jesus Christ here trying to save the world. Uh, another joke he said privately, he said, Wilson goes around with his 14 points. God only had 10. Um, he had a very specific demand. He would agree to the League of Nations, but for a price. And as he said at the very beginning of the peace conference, we are here to decide on Germany's guilt and how much they're going to pay for that guilt. The third one uh, is the Prime Minister of England by the end of the war, David Lloyd George. And he's going to agree with France. He, he maybe not quite as angry as Clemenceau, but he's going to agree with France. He had been very recently elected to Prime Minister. Um, he had some very strong demands that the people of Britain gave to him, you know, before he arrived. He was expected... Uh, to uh, get a lot of money, 300 billion pounds, other words, dollars, 300 billion they were expecting from Germany after this, uh, because the English economy had been absolutely decimated, and they wanted they wanted it paid back by Germany. The fourth member um, was a guy named Vittorio Orlando, the leader of Italy. Now, Italy, you know, I've barely even mentioned Italy this whole time. Um, they really shouldn't have been a part of this, frankly. Uh, and, and they came. They come into this with nothing. They were completely broke. Their their government was almost completely in anarchy. Um, during the war, they actually were on the side of Germany, and then at the last minute, they switched sides. Um, they wanted they wanted some money out of this. They wanted you know stuff they lost. They also wanted a port on the Adrian Sea. They're going to get none of this. Um, they should never really been a part of this, and they're not going to get anything. It's going to cause so much anger in Italy that we're going to see a revolution in Italy by the 1920s. We'll get into that later. Now, as I said, um, Germany is expected to pay for this war, which is an interesting thing. How do you do this? And this guy... Uh, from Britain, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, if you're into economy, this guy, Keynesian 
uh, economics is something that America still practices, and that's we get we get that from this guy, obviously. But um, he had to he headed up a committee to decide how much money would Germany have to pay, which is an interesting phenomena, you know. So they're going, okay, so many people died in say England, and so many ships were destroyed, and so many weapons were destroyed, and so we're going to add that bill up. And, you know, as people always say, how can you put a price on a human life? Of course, uh, we do that all the time. It's called a life insurance policy. <laughs> so we technically do that. But anyway, so they what they ended up doing was saying, OK, um, the way that he decided to do it was uh, take a person and say, what's the average in a life, what's the average amount of money that person would earn? And that's how they came up with the price. Uh, but of course, they figured they came up with just this massive number. And he said, look, Germany's destroyed in this war. It may be their fault, but they're destroyed. They might be able to pay up to about a 10 billion in U.S. dollars. That's it. Uh, the, the bill they're going to be get they're going to get is so much more than that. And he said, this is going to wreck Germany and it's going to cause another war. And he was right. He ended up resigning. He was out of there. He said, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Um, and he, he ended up walking away. He wrote a book about this, and in the book he wrote um, really gives way too much credit. In fact, he's kind of one of the reasons why we've kind of said over the years that Germany wasn't to blame, uh, because he was so angry. He also was a very young man, and so he so there's also a little bit of the arrogance of youth here. Uh, he was absolutely right that uh, the reparations were way too high, but at the same time, he ends up giving Germany way too much credit for uh, being innocent, if you will. So he's also kind of the creator of that idea that Germany was was not to blame for the war. Um, so once they come up with their plan, then they invite Germany to come. So Germany had no say in any of this at this point. Um, and again, Germany saw some fighting, especially in the western part of Germany, the part next to France. But uh, the leaders of the delegation from Germany were on a train, and when they crossed the border on their train, this is the kind of thing they saw. And apparently they looked at each other, and they, when they saw the level of destruction that Germany actually went for, they couldn't believe it. And they, and they all looked at each other and said, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. So this was the delegation. It was a, a six-man delegation. Um, one thing that we'll get into later, not in that lecture, but but part really part three, uh, was the anti-Semitism of the Nazis, right? And one of the things that, that Hitler is going to say is that the Jews stabbed us in the back. The Jews started World War I, and it was the bankers that blah, 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 you know. Um, but actually... Jewish Germans played a major role. Over half a million people of Jewish faith fought for the Germans. Uh, and two of the members of the German delegation were Jewish. So uh, this idea that, that Jews somehow weren't part of Germany and that they you know, were working against Germany is total bunk. You know, it's a total myth. And every so often I'll still hear people talk like that. You know, anyway, um, this was the actual delegation. Um, they were housed in uh, the basement of a hotel. Uh, which was bugged, and they knew it was bugged, you know, with with microphones. So they used to play a record player really loud, so that the you know the the people running, basically the Supreme Council couldn't hear what they were saying. Then they arrived, and this is them. They're at the head of the table. They have arrived, and they're presented with the treaty. And this was the leader of the uh, of the delegation. And they couldn't believe what they saw. They were going to accept full responsibility for this. Um, and the count basically said, and he pretty much yelled at them. He said, the treaty which our enemies laid before us, insofar as the French dictated it, is a monument of fear and hatred. And they refused to sign it. They were not going to sign this at all. Uh, and the entire delegation resigned. I guess really went one slide too far. Sorry. Uh, I'll explain this in just a moment. Uh, and they went. And so basically the, the Supreme Council said, including Wilson, said, uh, if you don't sign this, you need to leave 
and you need to send a delegation here that will sign it. And if you don't, we're going to go back to war and we're going to destroy Germany. This was Wilson saying this. So the delegation left. They were done. Uh, Germany, the, their government fell apart. A new government, the Weimar Republic. Republic means no king, right? So the Weimar Republic replaced it. Uh, they sent a new delegation and they signed it. Now, one of the parts of the agreement uh, was that Germany had to give, basically give its navy uh, to France. And so instead of doing that, Germany destroyed its own navy. They scuttled their navy. Um, so again, you can, you can see how Germany feels about this whole thing. Uh, they're not going to agree to any of this. So, but again, the new delegation does show up from the Weimar Republic. They do sign the agreement. They don't want to, but they don't have a choice. Basically, a gun's pointed at their head. And the world celebrates the greatest moment in history. You know, but as Germany was signing its peace terms, this is a, a typical political cartoon, they were signing away what they consider to be the glory of Germany. And it is going to cause major anger and resentment over the next 20 years. Um, and again, here's another political cartoon showing them being forced a peace pie down their throats. And so when the Supreme Council walked out, here they are. They were greeted with cheers and celebrations, uh, not realizing they were really setting the stage for another war. So the peace treaty itself, uh, Germany was forced to sign the treaty, accept full responsibility for the entire war. Um, they were not allowed any Navy or Air Force, basically no military except for what was essentially a small police force. Uh, they weren't allowed to be a member of the new league. Eventually, they do join the League of Nations, but not initially. They had to give up any colonies that they still had. Uh, they lost, again, a lot of land to France. They weren't allowed to have any major weapons, no tanks, no subs, no airplanes. And they would have to pay reparations, which was in modern dollars over $400 billion. Um, they won't pay this off until October 2010 when they finally paid this whole thing off. Um, but of course, Germany wasn't the only country in this. The Ottoman Empire was also fighting uh, with Germany. Their empire was completely dismantled. It was divided up between France and England, which creates the modern nations of Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the Palestine, which is today Israel. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is going to cause so much anger in the Islamic world. 9-11, um, uh, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, when they finally took credit for that, and, they, and Osama bin Laden sent out this videotape in fall of 2001, and he talked about all the reasons he did that. He mentions this. Most Americans don't even know about this. He mentions this. And the Middle Eastern world and the Islamic world the Treaty of Versailles is still seen as a major, major, major uh, slap in their face. And we're going to get more into that later. I have a whole lecture about Israel. We're going to talk about that later. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, whose uh, Archduke started this whole thing, right? Their empire was dismantled. Um, there was a little bit of the, what becomes the nation of Austria. Sometimes it's called the German rump, you know, uh, was left of this me pretty major empire. Czechoslovakia, Poland, Yugoslavia was created out of this, also partly out of Russia and Germany as well. Uh, Hungary lost uh, Transylvania. So again, completely carved up. But, but who benefits from this? France and England benefit from all of this. This is, this is revenge. And Russia, um, which initially was on uh, the same side, but they break away and because they go, they're going through a communist revolution and because they weren't represented at this conference, they're going to lose a lot of stuff, including these areas like Finland, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. And if you know anything about World War II, one of the first major invasions of World War II was Russia invading Finland. Um, so again, we are setting up what's going to be World War II. So this is what Europe looked like after the war. And again, the, the purple are all the new countries created out of these old empires. By the way, notice who did not have to give up their empire, France or England. Uh, this is the Middle East after the empire. So all the, all the Ottoman Empire now looks like this, a bunch of new countries. Africa, 
now looks like this after this. And, and the area with the stripes, that was the old German areas. And then finally, the League of Nations. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the League of Nations just for a moment. It was initially, for a moment, it was based in London, but basically Geneva, which is where a lot of, um, a neutral place in Europe, that's where a lot of, of, of these multinational uh, agreements used to be, like the Geneva Convention, for instance. So the League of Nations was an actual entity. And, you know, today we always, oh, it sucked, it was awful, and it was flawed, but it could have worked. And I do want to talk a little bit, because most people know nothing about League of Nations other than it didn't work. So, again, it was based in Geneva, originally had 42 members. Uh, by the end, which was World War II, it had over 60, uh, although it never had 60 at any one time. You know, it, I think the max it ever had at any one time was about 58. But, but you know, so some member would join and then they would leave and somebody else would join. Um, but everyone was equal. The idea, no matter how small or big your country were, you were supposed to be equal membership, which is the United Nations has the same idea. Uh, here's, again, this 1926, but showing the actual League of Nations meeting. So one of the problems with it right from the start was the United States didn't join it. It was our idea, but we didn't join it. Why didn't we join it? Because had we joined it, History may, in fact, be quite different. We may not have seen World War II had we joined it. Well, we voted our Congress, because any agreement has to go through Congress, and Congress voted not to do it. And uh, Democrats and Republicans all didn't want it. And part of the reason was Americans didn't want to go in World War I. Americans have always been isolationists. We still are. Even though we are involved in the world, you talk to, I, I bet a lot of you in this class have said in your life, oh, I don't care what happens over in Africa. I don't care what happens out. The coronavirus. And I was even a little guilty of this myself. Ah, that's happening in China. That doesn't matter to us. Uh, there's always been this impulse in American history to be isolationist, to not care about the rest of the world. And in 1919, after World War I, Americans did not want to have anything to do with the rest of the world. And we thought, oh, my God, this League of Nations, we're going to constantly be involved in petty wars. We don't want to be involved in this. So, um, you know, some people, however, recognize that this was a mistake. So just like there were some people that didn't believe a United States could work, there were people who didn't believe that League of Nations could work. But one of the main reasons for this is that this was a... a, a, a you know, a really radical idea, and it had to be sold to the American public. And if you sell it to the public, Congress will follow. Well, again, this is before modern television and radio and, and internet. So, you know, you had to get out and make speeches. Woodrow Wilson's arrogance played a big role in this. Woodrow Wilson wanted the credit. He would not let anybody else talk about this. So he got on a train called the Mayflower and he went all over the country giving speeches. And he, he was not a well man and he wore himself out because he didn't want to share the credit. And in Denver, Colorado, in September, he collapses on stage. Uh, there's no film of photographs of it, but he went back to the White House because he was exhausted. And October 3rd, his wife, Edith Wilson, who you see pictured here, she discovered him in the bathroom laid out on the floor, bleeding from his head. He had fainted, slammed into the sink that knocked him back onto the floor. He, ma he basically had a massive stroke. For several weeks, he was in a coma. And for the rest of his life, he could not use the left side of his body. He couldn't walk anymore. Nobody knew this. This is one of those big conspiracy, a real conspiracy. Um, nobody knew that he had had a stroke. That was kept secret. They knew he was sick. And the public didn't see him for a while, but that was normal. You know, you didn't, again, no television back then, no, no press conferences back then. But the vice president, Congress, uh, the cabinet did not know he had had a stroke. They just knew that he was ill. And in fact, for a little while, Edith Wilson ran the White House. The only people that knew about this was his doctor and a couple of servants. She, we know today, she signed some of the documents that he should have signed. We kind of had a female president already. Why did he have a stroke? Well, he, he had a very strange medical history, but the most likely cause is he had very, very bad teeth. 
and more than likely his bad teeth led to a blood disease that eventually led to a stroke. This is the, the first photograph of Wilson after he recovered. And notice you see Edith Wilson holding the paper he's signing. Notice he can't sign with the left side of his body. He never was back to normal. He did not sell uh, the League of Nations to the American public. So we don't join. We stay isolated. I, I have it in quotes because obviously we traded with countries and such. We just didn't take a role in what was going on. So to a large degree, um, the rival, the rise of Nazis, the rise of fascism happened because we didn't, we weren't involved. The League was weak from the beginning. It ultimately failed because World War II happened, but it wasn't a complete failure. This is um, a, a political cartoon that happened right after the League of Nations, excuse me, right after the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations was created. You see the Supreme Council walking away and Clemenceau says, curious, I seem to hear a child weeping. And I don't, don't ask me why the person's naked. Actually, the reason why the, the child's naked is because nakedness used to imply innocence. That's really why they're naked. It's still creepy. Anyway, you see this little kid crying and above their head, it says 1940 class. Because that kid's crying because that kid knows that in 20 years, he's going to be fighting a war. And what's crazy is that this actually predicted World War II, basically. And so because we didn't join the League of Nations, you know, uh, there is, you know, the leaders of Europe sowing the seeds of future wars. So was it a complete failure? And the actual reality is no, it did indeed have some successes. And we do forget this. Uh, there were some major border disputes that it, it managed to handle to keep us out of war for a while. For instance, there was a major debate uh, in Poland and in, in Czechoslovakia in 1921. And there was a big debate between Sweden and Finland that they managed to negotiate and keep us out of war. Um, it also helped fight a major drug trade and prostitution trade. It helped fight a huge refugee crisis in Russia uh, when they were starving after the communists took over. And there was an international court of justice that also managed to, to handle some international disputes. So it, actually, had it not been for the League, World War II might have began a lot earlier. But uh, in the huge, large picture, uh, it was a failure. The United States didn't join, so the United Kingdom and France ran it. They ran it to maintain their own interest. Um, it obviously didn't prevent most, prevent most aggressions by nations, as we'll see in the 30s. There was no real teeth to it because it didn't have a military. It didn't stop the Great Depression that happened in the 20s and 30s. And another major flaw was how it was designed. Every decision had to be unanimous. 58 members are going to be unanimous. You're not going to make any major decisions. So it could have been, it could have been a success, but in the big picture, it was a failure. So uh, Treaty of Versailles was the first step to the road to World War II. The next one will be the rise of communism, but that's for part two. This has already been way too long, so that will be in the part two. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you in the next lecture.